Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Stevens, FDA expert, panel witness, and all around great guy, Mr. Stevens. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for uh, for joining us today. I, I came up with this topic because I knew it would confuse a lot of people, and particularly Michelle, because she nice. said, what do you mean? You, get, you, you, you prove safety and efficacy and FDA is not happy. And the fact is, yes, that can happen. And I'm going to explain how that can happen. More importantly, I'm going to explain how you can prevent it happening to you like it happened to me. Okay. Hmm. You learned <laughs> okay. this the hard way when you were on now, the other side. The, uh, the, the question of, of you know, uh, Joe mentioned that I, I do expert witness work. And the question is, how does one become an expert witness? Well, you have a weird career. I went to work for FDA in 1972 and left in 1982. And the 76 is when the device law was passed. I went into the industry in 82 as a regulatory manager, worked my way up top VPR, QA, and clinical for some big companies, startups. And then in 2000, I went back to FDA and spent another 11 years. And uh, the, the lawyers like that because I can speak from an industry perspective. I spent 18 years in the industry. I know how it works. Uh, I know what regulatory people go through in the industry. And uh, I can also speak about how FDA works because I was within FDA within their enforcement group. So I can talk about that. And this so is really based on my industry experience in the sense of uh, what, what, what I'm gonna talk about. Now, if I saw the title of this presentation and didn't think about it, I'd say, what the hell is he talking about? Because we know FDA even says safety and effectiveness is what they're looking for. And I took these two quotes out of the FDA website. The first is from uh, Cedar that says, the goals of the NDA provide information to put the reviewer to make the following decision whether the drug is safe and effective for its proposed use. Okay, safe and effective. Well, nothing else, right? Okay, pre-market approval. That's, we know that that's the process for class three devices. Uh, they say the same thing there. It's scientific regulatory review to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of class three medical devices. So the question is, if you have a device and you generate the data that it's safe and effective, what else is there? Uh, it, that would seem to be based on what FDA says, all you need to uh, put your device through the FDA and get it on the market, but it's not. And I'm gonna tell you why. What possibly could be needed beyond safety and efficacy? I use the term clinical utility, but it really means a successful device. In other words, uh, safety and efficacy is our two sets of data that shows the device does something. It's effective at doing something. But the question is, does it really provide a, a clinical benefit to the patient? And, and have you proven that particularly? So uh, add that third, third concept, clinical utility, and I'll be mentioning that during the entire presentation uh, because that's the, that's the take home from, from my talk today. Now, I say here, what, why do you want clinical utility? Well, I, I prevent the, say to prevent the so what question, so what comment by uh, uh, the, the a physician that you present your product to. If you said to the doctor, doctor, I've got this product and this is what it does. And, and the doctor says to you, so what? You go, what do you mean? What he's saying is how does it benefit the patient? Uh, and and that, that's clear now. Uh, I got to say that when it comes to clinical utility, your sales force and your marketing po folks are the ones that know what this means the most, because if they have a successful product, when it's presented to the doctor, he says, I want to buy that product. And that, that means they got the clinical utility part right. I'm going to use first an example of a common product that's been out there a while that would we we're going to look at it from a clinical utility standpoint now the safety and efficacy what is that it it's designed in a way you can stick it in somebody's mouth and they don't get sick it doesn't break and it gives you a temperature indication now this picture one uh, that i have here uh if you look at that closely you'll understand this is a european uh product and why is that because the range is 35 to 40 <laughs> it's 37 degrees it's 98.6 degrees and i and i just took a picture off the internet you know it's interesting i was looking for a picture of an oral thermometer and i had a hard time finding the old-fashioned one because all the ones now are digital and, and there's hundreds of digital when you stick it in the mouth and you, get it, you don't even have to look at the the, the thermometer 
scale anymore. You just read it right off of it. So it's still out there. Okay, is it a medical device? Well, FDA's classified it. Uh, this is the classification. Uh, those regulatory people know this screen very well. The product code regulation of a device class, class two device. So it requires a 510K, although it may, may be exempt. I didn't look closely, but it, very low risk device. Mostly all class one devices are exempt and some class two are. Okay, well, what is the indications for use for an oral thermometer? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It's a medical thermometer used for measuring human or animal body temperature. Uh, that definition tells you it all, the FDA also regulates animal devices, but we're talking today about the, the human animal and you measure body temperature. Straightforward, what else would it be used for? Okay, let's look at the history of it. Uh, so an English physician, Sir Thomas Albut, Albut interesting name, um, invented the first medical thermometer in 1867, over 150 years ago. But I'm gonna say Sir Thomas Albert uh, had to go through the FDA uh, when he invented this uh, in 1867. And the FDA said, what is, so you, you measure the temperature, so what? What does it mean? Okay, and so, Sir Thomas Albert would have to have designed a clinical trial, or he may have just hung it up and we wouldn't have thermometers today. <laughs> I'm going to, theoretically, I'm his regulatory consultant. I'm going to talk to him about what he needs to do to, to get the data necessary. So the, the so what question, you take the temperature of a person and it's 101 degrees Fahrenheit. I, that's probably 38 degrees Celsius. And, and the question is, so what? Now you and I say, well, obviously, if they have a high temperature, there's something wrong with the person. They probably have an infection or something, and they and they need to go see their doctor or go to the emergency room or something because that's that's bad. But we know that from the medical history of it. If you, back when he first invented this, the 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 temperature of the patient was interesting, but no one I'm sure tied it necessarily to. Well, maybe they did. Who knows? But problem is. So what? Okay, so let's look at the study that, that we're going to do to establish the clinical utility of an oral thermometer. The goal, uh, a tangible human benefit, that's the key thing, to the diagnostic use of an oral thermometer. We're going to design this as a control study because we know FDA really likes uh, control groups and comparison data. And we're going to have two study groups. The first one, patients who have a thermometer reading and then get treated. Okay. The, the control group is, is comparable patients, i.e. the demographics, uh, treated without the use of a thermometer. And then we're gonna look at the outcomes. And uh, the key is, I'm gonna say there's gonna be a 30% reduction in hospital costs and a 10% reduction in deaths if, if the diagnosis is made with a thermometer and, or not made with a thermometer. Study costs, I say 1.5 million. Anybody who's done a clinical trial knows they're terribly expensive. And you do not want to do the wrong trial. Uh, you want to make sure. Now, when I say anticipated outcome, uh, I, I put verify significance. And we'll talk more about that. But the point is, uh, if you tell a doctor that if you use this device, we're going to reduce hospital overall hospital costs by 30%, you got their attention. Uh, more likely the hospital administration. But, but then a 10% reduction in deaths. OK, significant. So. Uh, I hope the doctor, I think, would say, if you can do this, I will use that product. The question is, can you do it? I don't know. If anybody wants to give me a million and a half dollars, we'll do the study and see how, how well it works. But uh, those are pretty ambitious outcomes. I, re I recognize that. Okay. Okay. Now that we've talked about uh, the theoretical clinical utility of an oral thermometer, I'm going to give you a real world example of the so what phenomenon. Okay. And it's very personal to me. Uh, it's, a, it's the story of Retroperfusion Systems, Inc. Now, the reason it's a story for me, this was one of my very early jobs in the industry. Uh, I was hired by them in 1988 as their manager of regulatory and quality. Uh, I had a lot of FDA experience. I didn't have a lot of business experience. Uh, and the technology had been developed by Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. And the, the physicians there had been experimenting with it and they believed that it had a real positive impact on treating a condition called myocardial ischemia. I'm gonna give you a little cardiology lesson today to, to help you understand this a little bit more. 
but the point is, uh, if I were the Larry Stevens that I am today, and I was with Metro Perfusion, we wouldn't have done the study we did, but I didn't know enough. I relied on the doctors to, to just say, this is the study we should do. These are the endpoints we did. You know, what, what did I know? So that's, what, that's my uh, root cause analysis. Uh, nobody in the company had the depth of knowledge to understand the, the implications of the study design. Message there, use consultants. You can't hire me, uh, even if you wanted to, probably don't, um, for what you hire. I was, you know, making, you know, 50,000 a year then, of course, this was 40 years ago, uh, but you, you, you can't hire the kind of expertise you need, but you can buy it on a temporary basis. And that's my consultant sale. Go for those experts, hire them, get them to review what you're doing, get your comments on it, because that would have helped retroperfusion a lot. Okay. Well, what is a retroperfusion device? Well, there it is. <laughs> this is the uh, the patent device, uh, patent diagram, but it's a good one to explain uh, what retroperfusion is. Uh, this is the body. This is the heart. This is the femoral uh, artery. And what it is, it's taking blood out of the femoral artery. It's going through this pumping system here. It's being pumped in here into what's called a coronary sinus catheter. Goes into the right atrium, goes down to the opening of the great cardiac vein and you, you catheterize the great cardiac vein. So you have a, a, cycle, a circuit built here of arterial blood going into the heart, into the main drain of the venous system or the origin of the venous system in, in the heart. Now, why would you wanna do that? Well, um, if, if a, an artery gets blocked, uh, the part of the heart distal to the block or beyond the block becomes ischemia. Ischemia is lack of blood flow, and that's not good. Uh, a giant myocardial ischemia is called acute myocardial infarction, and you die from it. Uh, so you need arterial blood flowing in your heart, all of your heart. Uh, but uh, when it gets blocked, there's a section of the heart that doesn't get blood. And, and the one other aspect of this device, it's got within a the capabilities and the software to record ECG because it's a diastolic pumping action. So, uh, systole is the contraction, diastole is the, the relaxation. So this pump would only activate when the heart was relaxed. So it's synchronized with the heartbeat, but it was slightly off timing. So the heartbeat beats, the pump is off, the, the heart rests, the pump goes on. So you're getting, why would you, why do you have to do that? Well, it's the laws of physics. Um, when the heart is relaxed, you can pump arterial blood back and it will selectively go to the ischemic area because that's the low pressure area. So you raise the pressure in the vein with arterial blood and that arterial blood then will search out the lowest pressure area, which is the ischemic area. And guess what? It works. That's, that was the, all the animal experiments showed. You tie off an LAD in a dog, uh, you retroperfuse them and the heart function returns even with the LAD blocked. So perfect, okay. Patients, Patients that, that would be eligible for this, uh, acute myocardial infarction. Someone's having a heart attack. They come in the hospital, put them on retroperfusion. Keep the heart going until you can fix it. Uh, the other way is that at this time, remember this was about over 40 years ago, um, the common treatment for coronary artery disease was angioplasty, balloon catheters. Now, if you blow up a balloon in a catheter, excuse me, a balloon in a vessel, uh, that balloon is going to block the blood flow in that vessel. So if it's the main, the left anterior descending or the left main artery, the main artery of the heart, and you blow it up with that balloon, the heart goes into great distress. Uh, so gosh, uh, high-risk angioplasty. Those patients wouldn't get angioplasty. They would go for surgery instead because it was too risky to blow up that balloon in, in, a, in an area of the artery that put a lot of the heart in jeopardy. So uh, we're gonna, we're gonna say, we're gonna do a clinical trial to measure the ability of retroperfusion to relieve myocardial ischemia. Okay, what, what, were, what, were, what did we measure or what was the doctor's advice to measure? Reduction of ST elevation. Now, this is an EKG and I'll, I'm not, not gonna explain it all because I'm not an expert, but the best, this is a normal EKG. This is the PQR, the big peak is the contraction of the heart. When the heart relaxes, you get the S and then it rebounds into the T 
and then goes back into another heart. Well, when you get the arterial blockage, this S, this is a, an example of, of, an, of a myocardial ischemia. The, S, the ST part has gone up and you can measure uh, the, the increase of that and, and, and calculate it. So uh, the idea is if you re reduce ST elevation, uh, you're relieving myocardial ischemia and that's good for the patient. Uh, if you go into a hospital with severe chest pain and they put an EKG on you and they see this electrocardiogram, they go, oh my God, they're having an arm infarct, get them into the, to the cath lab or OR, we got to get on right away. So ST elevation is a common indication of myocardial ischemia, very well accepted by the, by the medical community. Okay. The, uh, the assumptions behind the study was that first of all, my, myocardial ischemia is bad. Can't argue that, it's not, not a good condition. Uh, ST elevation indicates the presence of myocardial ischemia. We know that, we've seen the data that. Reducing the ST elevation is good. Okay, is it? Uh, a clinical endpoint is a significant reduction of ST elevation. So we do a study, we look at ST with the pump on, with the pump off, and we can calculate the ST elevation on it. And this, this is the way the whole trial was set up. Uh, multi-center clinical trial, high-risk angioplasty. Those are those patients who, when you blow the balloon up, it's too much of the heart is derived of blood flow. Uh, the patients has their own control. That made the study smaller. The, the way that worked was uh, that uh, you uh, put the balloon in the patient uh, and you start retroperfusion. You look at their ST, you turn retroperfusion off and you look at what the, what the ST does and the patient then has their own control. And then st statistical significance. We, we know that that's something you look for when you're measuring anything in the sense of two different things. Is it statistically different? Okay, well, this was actually a public, this was a publication in the Journal of American College of Cardiology in 1991, uh, a couple of years after the study was done, uh, after the PMA had been submitted. Uh, and it talked about uh, the 30 patients that were studied and they, they measured three outcomes. The second one is the one we we're talking about, the magnitude of ST segment change, and it tells what it was, uh, and a p-value of less than 0.05. It also measures, uh, wall motion abnormalities. In other words, when, when you get ischemic heart, that part of the muscle is not contracting like it is. So on a two-dimensional echocardiogram, you look at it, you see part of the heart is kind of paralyzed and that's called a wall motion abnormality. And they, they saw that, that they could improve that. And left ventricular wall motion, which is similar to wall motion abnormality, but this is a ventricular wall, uh, significantly less. Okay. The, uh, the, Conclusions, retroperfusion significantly reduced and delayed the onset of coronary angioplasty induced myocardial ischemia and provided an effective supportive therapy for failed and complicated angioplasty. Okay, we've, we've proven what we need to prove. Okay, so uh, this is, <laughs> I like to say, tell people this, I wrote an entire PMA and I did. I was the only regulatory guy in a company. So when I would come in the morning, I would start writing and I would get information and I'd write more. But let me tell you, the PMA, of 1988 was not the same PMA today. It was uh, one volume with a whole bunch of parts. So uh, one person could do it. There's no way a, a single person could write an entire PMA. Well, if they had a year to do it, uh, uh, it's, it's always a joint effort now. The, the, the PMAs are in modules and the individual modules are submitted. It, so that's, it's a completely different world. But back then, a regulatory guy who, who could write uh, could write an entire PMA. And guess what? The conclusion uh, that was put in the clinical section of the PMA was exactly the conclusion of the study. And the, uh, the, as would happen, this device, when it came, went to FDA, was, was brand new. Uh, nobody had ever had a retroperfusion device authored for sale on the market. Uh, there was a lot of medical questions about it in the sense of its value. And that is enough to refer for FDA to, to use their circulatory systems device advisory panel. Uh, most PMAs go to the panel. Now, as it would happen, I have experience on that panel. Uh, I was on for four years in the late eighties. Uh, I was the industry representative on the circulatory systems panel. What did that mean? I saw companies come in and present their, their PMA data as fate would have it when the retroperfusion people, I was out of the company by then. Uh, once the PMA was on, I, they didn't need me anymore. And a big company in Irvine called Edwards Laboratories was looking for a VPRAQA, a big job. And I 
they offered me enough that I said goodbye to retroperfusion, went there and sat on that panel and saw. So I'm going to relate what I saw when, when retroperfusions presented their data to the advisory panel. Uh, the panel itself has practicing physicians. They, in this case, they were cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, cardiac surgeons. Uh, you, you have to remember back in the in the 70s, if, if you were alive, uh, that cardiac surgery for coronary artery disease was very common. The single, double, quadruple bypass surgeries, uh, that's, that's how they treated severe coronary artery disease. And when angioplasty came in, uh, in the late 70s, um, the patients that would have gone to surgery went to treated by the interventional cardiologist. Well, you think the cardiac surgeons were very happy? No. So I'm not saying this cardiac surgeon was, was not happy to see a, a device coming in that's going to open up angioplasty to more patients, but it's possible. But he, he was the quote of the so what. The, the doctor from retroperfusions presented the ST data and the surgeon says, oh, so you significantly lowered ST elevation. So what? How did that benefit the patient? What were the patient's outcome? Did you improve patient outcome when you did this? Is there any data to show people's lives were improved, their quality of life was improved, that they saved their life? And he went on and on and on. And I'm sitting there uh, as, as the industry representative. And I, my, my job as the industry representative is not to intervene on behalf of the companies. It's to watch where the panel might be doing things that went foul of what their role as defined by FDA was. And I didn't talk very much. But anyway, uh, the panel voted to recommend non-approval to FDA and a recommendation that the clinical trial be run with clinically significant endpoints. Now those, the panel didn't say clinically significant endpoints, but that's what they meant. I know now that that was, so rerun the trial. Okay, FDA sends a letter to, to retroperfusion saying, um, you gotta redo the trial, do this. Okay, so what happened to retroperfusion systems? Well. You and I both know that every device has a certain life to it. It's got a product entry day and a day later on where the better mousetrap is made, where somebody develops a device that makes the treats your patients in an easier, safer way, okay? Um, ideally, your company is the one that develops the device that takes the market away from your previous device. But if you're a startup company, uh, you probably don't have that. Best. So what happened, first of all, acute myocardial infarction, tissue plasminogen activator, TPA. Uh, you may have heard of that. I think you probably have. It's a clot busting drug. And it came available uh, in the late 70s. And uh, the uh, tra treatment when people would came in with acute myocardial infarction, they would give them a shot of TPA and the clot would dissolve and it would open up. Well, that's, that's a lot easier than putting retroperfusion in. So TPA took away the AMI market completely. Okay, angioplasty, high-risk angioplasty. Somebody invented something they called the stack catheter after Dr. Stack. And what the stack catheter had was a through lumen. And what I mean is that when you blew up the balloon to block the artery, uh, the, the catheter had an inlet proximal to the, to the balloon that arterial blood could go through and, and provide blood flow, arterial blood flow distal to the balloon. Wow. That, 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 that gets away of the ischemia that's induced when you do a, a left main occlusion. So stack catheter, TPA, there was no market for retroperfusion. Uh, the company closed. They had about 30 uh, retroperfusion devices. They're, they're kind of cool looking, at least they, did, they were then. I, I don't know where those are at now, but they closed down. And the vast, the third bullet is the one that um, investors don't like to see. I'm sure there were some investors in retroperfusion that weren't happy with what happened, but they lost their money. This, 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 this was a failed attempt. Now, I've done my post-mortem on it and said, the study wasn't designed correctly. Uh, you know, the, the doctors who defer, determine the endpoint were researchers and ST meant a whole lot to them, but to that surgeon in FDA advisory panel, it didn't mean better outcomes. And that's what he was interested in. So basically I wanna conclude now and uh, talk about why proving safety and efficacy may not be enough for FDA. Well, I've showed you, uh, the, it clearly wasn't enough for retroperfusion. 
the, the key is establishing clinically significant endpoints. Now, how do you how do you do that? Well, as I said, I'll repeat it because Joe likes me to repeat how important the marketing people are. Is the the market opportunity by the the salesmen and the clinical people uh, are they know what the market needs are. They know what the patient needs are. They know what the what the where the parts of that patient's treatment isn't optimized yet. They know which patients aren't getting treated appropriately, and that's the key from getting those endpoints that shows that. And once you've worked internally and you think you have clinically significant endpoints, go outside, go to those potential physician customers, particularly the thought leaders, uh, the ones that are out there talking in the market. If you're developing a device, for example, to treat heart failure, and I'm working with a company that is doing that now, uh, the key is uh, going to the, the physicians that treat heart failure and say to them, we have a product that can relieve cardiorenal symptoms. Uh, what, what that is, is when a person's in heart failure, uh, the heart is not pumping enough blood out. The, the entrance to the renal arteries is halfway down the aorta and the blood doesn't flow down those and you get kidney failure. And kidney failure then produces edema. A piece of patients in heart failure are in the hospital all the time getting diuretics and being treated for heart failure. It's very expensive. You tell them, we got a product that's gonna restore kidney function uh, and allow the production of urine again and get rid of the edema and that. You got a, you got an attention from a, from a physician that, treat, that treats um, heart failure. So that, that, that endpoint is validated. The question is when you do your study, uh, uh, you you need to obviously if you if you believe me <laughs> that you need to make sure your endpoints are the ones that are important to the physicians and the patients and if that's what you've done then you've gone beyond basic safety and efficacy and you've added to that you've also proven clinical utility and I thank you all for your time uh, I uh, have my here's my commercial uh, I have my company one way consultants. Uh, that's our website. You can look at there and see what we do. Uh, I will be glad to discuss things. I most of my time these days is taken up with expert witness, which is fine with me. It's physically as well. Fasting and I thank you for your talking. And I know Joe has some things to comment on. Right. Well, first, that was a great presentation, and it was so sound all the way through that I had no opportunity to interrupt you, which says a lot. <laughs> well, that's a first. <laughs> yeah, no, that was really solid. Um, my first comment is about your thermometer. Uh, oh, okay. Two things. One, Luke uh, reacted very immaturely when you said the doctor's name was Al Butt. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted everyone to know that. I'm sorry. He was snickering in a very immature way. I thought that. I'm, I'm an American. I can't speak European. <laughs> um, but back then, uh, and perhaps you addressed it, and, and I've lost it. How would he have? proven clinical utility. It would have taken him a year or two to show well, the relationship between high fever and hospital costs. Well, again, I don't think that the, the, the thought patterns were there. I think that we all know <coughs> that if your kid is sick and you touch their forehead and it's hot, there's something wrong. And I think that's what he probably did was knowing that the temperature in patients is an indication of things going wrong. So I'm going to get a device that measures that temperature. And I think he, he went out there and showed that to doctors. They found out that they could provide these to their, their, their customers or their, their patients, I guess. Uh, ultimately, it became a, it's probably the single most common medical device in people's medicine cabinets around the world, the, the thermometers. So I think he has, his was more of a word of mouth thing and providing it to them and letting them see how it worked. And that, because that's before FDA, that's how you got a device on the market. You, but, it, but if it were invented today, it would take two years to come to market. If I would agree, if, if no, if, if nobody had developed a thermometer, a diagnostic thermometer, and came and said, uh, "We're going to measure temperature in patients," they'll get the well. So what? Uh, what does that temperature mean? Now we know that would be a ridiculous statement today, but if they didn't know that, then they would say, "So what?" And you would have to do that study. Well, I would hope that 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 individual. That entrepreneur was a member of MDG Premium and <laughs> was based out of Maryland and gave me an opportunity to invest. So I would get a third of my money back right away. 
Well, I can tell you, I think Sue has a clinically significant product because I've watched the success of her company. And uh, that kind of excitement doesn't come for a product that doesn't offer a big clinical benefit. So congratulations, Sue. <laughs> Andre? Uh, thanks. So Larry, just uh, I was involved in what, what triggered me was when you talked about the utility and the uh, a physician saying the utility for the product. Uh, I actually was involved in a, presenting a, a, a surgical device, uh, a surgical tool that was developed by an orthopedic surgeon that we then designed for him on an engineering standpoint. And we actually went down. Now, this was a while ago, so maybe things have changed, but this was about 15 years ago. And we went down to a panel. There's about 20 people from FDA at the panel. And the orthopedic surgeon himself was there. And I, I was there to present the technical aspects, but then he presented the way it would be used in, in surgery. And it was a bifurcated blade, which would save the time from, for them trying to determine two parallel cuts on a, on a, a surgical knee. Uh, but then when the end result came back, uh, the FDA did not consider it to have utility. And yet we had an orthopedic surgeon there that was saying he needed this device. So where did, how do you, going forward, how do you present the utility? Well, uh, I, I, I empathize with you that the doctors at Cedar sinai Medical Center back when I was working with them, that was a cardiology center of the, of the country. And the guy that was consulting with us was a, a top-notch cardiologist and, and, uh, was of the impression that that endpoint was a significant endpoint. You prove it. So the key is is go to go to other doctors, not just the one who invented it. Go to other other doctors who practice the same thing and present the concept to them. See what they feel about. If you get that validation from people who don't have a personal interest in, uh, and, 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 and again, uh, the panels are, ever, are not predictable. I have to do that. <laughs> but then, Larry. But so let's assume we did do that back then. Would we then present what? We'd present comments from the additional surgeons to the panel? Well, again, the if the panel says we, we're going to recommend FDA that there's not enough data on it, the company can take the position, yes, there is enough data, and supplement your PMA with additional data, additional medical analysis, and, and convince FDA that it really is a good product. Because FDA does not have to follow the, the panel recommendation, but you need to address those concerns so that FDA goes, oh, now we understand we can approve the product. That's your only chance is uh, convincing FDA that you've got the data they need. Okay, thanks. Sure. I sit here as a packaging engineer, but having worked with regulatory people, um, I, I, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I, I've got, um, I get two comments. One is clinically significant. You keep saying that, but that just means something that improves a patient outcome. That's, that's all that means, right? Like, well, I think in a, all in a basic those, sense, yes. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I wanted to say, I was working in a company where the regulatory person looked at me one day and said, our device doesn't help people it causes more problems and I've got to figure out how to say that to the uh, how not to say that to the FDA so they will approve our product I do not like that I will not use those devices in my lifetime how do you, how does the or when does the FDA look through those kinds of things and see that kind of BS coming to them or do they well <laughs> because it was approved <laughs> Okay, well, again, uh, the, the company may not have been forthright with FDA, and, and that's that's a no-no, but not, there are times keep, people keep negative data out of their submissions. And, oh, and they, didn't, uh, they didn't hide any data. They just wrote it in such a way that the FDA thought it was great. Well, that's those regulatory people. They can really write well. <laughs> so we've got to watch out for ourselves, too, oh, and no, understand actually, their... I, I, worked, I worked at a company that was working on this great product uh, it was an interventional cardiology product for, for total occlusions. And uh, they, the, the idea was, it was called the linear everting balloon. The idea was a balloon that would come out and go through a, a, a total occlusion. And I was at a meeting with uh, some other people from other companies. And he goes, you guys are working on that linear everting balloon, aren't you? Go, yeah. He says, it won't work. And I said, what do you mean it won't work? We tried that 10 years ago when I was over there. And the laws of physics are that when you evert the balloon, the balloon, the catheter backs up. It doesn't go through the occlusion because the occlusion has more resistance than the shaft of the catheter. And the only way you could fix it is have a, a completely rigid shaft. Well, if you have a completely rigid shaft, you can't get it into the artery. So I went back and I go, how do I tell the CEO of the company <laughs> that he's been out there promoting this balloon when I've got an engineer that told me? And eventually, 
I, I went to him and I said, I got some negative information. What do you mean? And I told him, he said, well, we're, our engineers are working on it. They'll, they'll overcome it. And I go, okay, I'm done. <laughs> and, it, it, and then six months later, they killed the project. But that that's a, internally, uh, those kind of issues happen. And I, the, the one you're talking about is, is great that they got it through. I, the question is- Well, they got it and other companies that have it through and basically it, patients will die using this technique minimally yeah. invasive thing well, I was rather say, than what the is the thing. market what is the market success of the product has their business grown and are people using it or, you know, people or... use it and it, and it's great for about a year and then they die wow but this is, <laughs> yeah, joe joe this is this is insight you, you've got to call uh, abc news and tell them that they're no, I'm joking i'm joking <laughs> i'm just i mean frankly, someday they will get better i i wanted to um I invited Shannon to show herself because we're talking about trials and utility. And I thought you could at least plug what you do for a living and at most comment on um, your observations from today's presentation. When should you unmute yourself? Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, I'm watching you on the big screen here. You're 85 inches wide. Oh my gosh, um, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of age. Um, I like this. Go back. Go oh, on. No, okay, I'm good. Just go in front of, I'm I'll good. just talk to you. Good. Of this. It'll be really Hey, oh everybody, it's me. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a human factors engineer. Uh, and so we're focused on, yeah, you can design a device that is safe and effective in a clinical trial when it's used perfectly. But as soon as users are not fully trained or if there's some design flaw that might cause them to misunderstand the device, it might not work at all. Um, and it actually might even cause harm if yeah. used incorrectly. Yeah. So um, that's what we're trying to uncover. Uh, that's a real problem, it's a good point. So I, I think there's something, there's kind of like two frontiers that are being pushed further these days. And it sounds like the frontier you're discussing today has been a focus of the FDA all along, um, this uh, clinical utility. But then I think right now also, we're kind of growing as an industry towards making sure that the products are actually usable as well. Now, absolutely, the human factors testing has become a huge issue with FDA. And that, that's relatively new. But the, 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 the key is FDA knows that uh, the skill levels of the physicians are, are, do vary. And you need to design a product that is, the term is called pokayoki or, or foolproof. <laughs> and uh, that the doctor who's the least skilled can use. And uh, that that's important because it prevents adverse reactions, adverse events. And that's what you're talking about. Uh, Do you foresee in the next period of time that the FDA will start um, requiring kind of real world style clinical trials? Because right now clinical trials, by, by definition, you're trying to oversee the use, you're trying to overtrain the users, you're trying to recruit the best surgeons in the nation to run it, right? right. But do you kind of foresee this whole real world evidence trend leading to integration of usability and clinical testing a little bit more? Oh yeah, well, absolutely. It's already started. It's called post-approval testing. Some of the conditions of the PMA is that you pre perform a post-approval study. And that's what FDA is looking for, a, a real world experience on a, on a controlled basis where they're getting information back looking for that. So I think it, it's important for companies when they design their trials to try and get real world experience. But FDA has already shown in the last few years that they are concerned about that by requiring post-approval studies. On a, they'll, they'll approve it, but they say, you got to do another 150 patients and provide data back to us on that. Because you got to remember FDA people, there's no incentive for them to take risk. And those device evaluators always work with the fear that I'm going to miss something, that I'm going to let something go, and it's going to go out there and it's going to kill somebody, and it's going to come back and haunt me. And I, I got to prevent that. So that means I need to ask more questions. And the 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 key is uh, we in the industry have to answer those questions. And you're, I think you're exactly right. They're more and more concerned about the real world, particularly with with uh, devices that are that are software controlled, AI devices, those kind of stuff. Uh, the human factors study and the design of the clinical trials are, are critical. I have a question for the post launch clinical study. Are you allowed to sell the product and then also include that person in the study or is it expected that those products are provided for free to those individuals participating? Well, you know, you can actually charge for investigational devices. The, the key is you can't make a profit. 
And most companies don't because uh, the doctors wouldn't object unless it's Medicare or authorized. But the, but the point is, is that uh, it, it's a business decision of whether or not you're going to provide devices free because that encourages people to use them, but it's also expensive for the company. So, you know, you get your approval, you can start selling it, whether you sell it to the doctors doing the post-approval study or not is another question because you, you, you want to encourage those doctors to participate in the study and they don't really have an incentive in the sense it's not new medicine. So you got to maybe you even have to pay a fee to the physicians per patient to, to make sure that they follow the protocol and get the right data. So it's, it's expensive, no doubt about that. But post-launch, you can sell the devices for profit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the idea is study. most companies don't make profits for the first couple of years, depending on how many millions of dollars they've spent. It's called positive cash flow. That may not come, you know, the, 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 for a year after the product release before you actually start taking money in that's profitable. So uh, the business world is quite aware of that. And that's one of the reasons these the marketing folks are on your case all the time. Get that sucker approved. Get that sucker approved. We got to get out there. We got to make money off of it. And I go, okay, Joe, take it easy. We're doing it the right way. <laughs> the answer to the question earlier about um, getting in trouble because you said something and you need to take it down. This was a question that I fielded some 13 years ago when I was working for cardiac science. Oh, we have to put everything through regulatory. Okay, I hear you. And that's why we put all of the things through regulatory that were on the website and were in brochures. And so manipulating those words in other sentences and other snippets is a derivative work. And I earned the trust of the company that I wasn't going to go afield and make any claims that we didn't already put through Agile. Then, as it relates to just telling stories, we sold AEDs. So if there was a story of someone who went into cardiac arrest and our device was used to resuscitate them, how is that a, you know, I'm just saying, wasn't it great that that AED was there? There's not a lot of risk there. So could, could some authority come down and say, you said that there, I suppose. Um, but you, you know, you, you take a, a risk, a reasonable risk here that, you know, I think that's a yeah, reasonable well, approach. That's that's what I trust me. I worked on both sides of the fence, uh, industry and FDA, and it's completely different in the industry because you have to take risk. You you can't wait for everything. You've got mm -hmm. to make a decision because of your business requirements, and you need to move forward. And sometimes you find out stuff that you go, oh, all right, I didn't really find it out. But see, FDA does, there's no incentive for FDA to hurry. There isn't. So making them feel good about you and your device and give them a lot of data is the best thing you can do to make them feel comfortable in allowing you to take your device to market. Larry, great job today. If there are no other comments, we'll call it for the week. And okay. next week, um, I'm not sure yet, we're either going to talk about how RAPS was or if I get um, Dwayne's approval, maybe we'll peek in on his med tech event in progress, maybe have a live stream. So we'll see if we can do that. One, one comment, Joe, I wanna yeah. thank you for the MDG. I was didn't know what this was a couple of years ago when I joined it and I found out it was an amazing organization for two reasons. One is there's good technical information, but probably even better is the networking part of it and the 10X conferences and, and getting around with people who are in the same business. And so Joe, you're a matchmaker, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that deeply, I do. And in fact, that's really, why I do it. And I, I say to a person who's considering coming to 10X that we're not going to teach you anything you can't learn online. It is about connections. And this is why Friday mornings are a highlight of my week. My, my work family, my work wives, husbands, brothers, and sisters all get together and we have a cup of coffee and uh, learn a thing or two. So Dr. Stevens, thank you for today. Thank you and all. Friends, I'll see you next week. Two weeks from today is a special day. It's my birthday. So <laughs> however you think it's appropriate, I do accept well wishes on LinkedIn, but that's kind of a little extra work for me. I can give you my address if you want to send gifts, chocolates, mm -hmm. and flowers. Thank you very much for Hage and Hage Enterprises. This is Joe Hage. I'll see you next week.